Again, good to see you all. If you would turn your Bibles to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. Find the book of Revelation um, and turn back a few pages. You'll find the epistle of 1 John. Let me know when you're there. Say amen. amen. Cozy, you didn't say amen. Are you there? Okay, she's in Exodus. Keep going. Keep going. All right, First John chapter 5. Let's read our text so we get the flow of thought starting in verse 1. All right, First John chapter 5 starting in verse 1. I'm reading today from the New American Standard Bible. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and whoever loves the Father loves the child born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and observe his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is the one who overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not with the water only, but with the water and with the blood. It is the Spirit who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. There are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and the three are in agreement. Now, did you notice anything different? Who noticed something different from how I read? Now, it depends perhaps on the translation of the Bible that you're using. If you're using the King James Version, you'll notice something different. And so the controversy here in this passage is verses 7 and 8. And these are, this, this is what's called in some circles the Johannine comma. All right. And so, as you know, we've been dealing with a series of tough questions throughout the summer, and we'll go into September with it a little bit. And, and there has been much debate, much ink has been spilt about this passage of Scripture, as well as other passages of Scripture as well. And the debate is whether or not it should be in the Bible or not. And the biggest issue here is between the King James Version and some other modern translations. So, for example, the King James Version reads, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. By the way, I have my, um, my 1611 replica up front again today, if you want to look at it, and I have it open to 1 John 5, so you can kind of look at that if you want to. But that's how the King James reads um, in verse 7. Listen to it from the English Standard Version. um, For there are three that testify. Again, the NASB, for there are three that testify. And then the Holman Christian Standard says, for there are three that testify. The NIV says, for there are three that testify. So how do we deal with this issue? You can see the difference. Again, the King James says, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And so the addition, or what's different in the King James is, it says the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And so those words um, bear witness of the Trinity. And that's what it's talking about here. And so as we answer the question for this message, and the question was, you know, how did this come about? Was this added later on? Um, And so as we answer that question, if you're taking notes, notice number one, the issue with 1 John 5 and verse 7. The issue with 1 John 5 and verse 7. Now, some people ask these questions that we get when it deals with Um, things in the Bible, whether it's things that were perhaps omitted or things that were perhaps added. Some people ask those questions out of sincerity, uh, which I think was the case with the person who asked this question. But there are also critics 
that are out there who will throw this stuff in our faces to try and prove that we can't trust the Bible. And so there's a whole slew of these types of things that are out there within the Bible that people will say, see, this is inconsistent, so you really can't trust the Bible. And so it's important to know how to answer these questions. And what I'll tell you today, the answer that I'll give today can be used to answer almost any of the so-called controversies that people will say about the Bible, all right? And so for today, just like we've been doing for all the questions, we're going to chip away at it. You know, some of these questions we could perhaps answer in five minutes, but the goal is to, to, to back into it so that we have the tools that when we go out, we could, we could talk to people who might bring these things up. And again, this could be used to answer almost all of these so-called controversies. And so we'll look at 1 John, um, but we'll also look at translations. We'll talk about translations a little bit. We'll talk about manuscripts a little bit. And we'll talk about why we're even having the debate anyways, all right? So notice letter A, the, one of the issues is that it appears only in the King James Version. Now, we're not going to examine every translation today. If you really want to study bibliology, I had taught on this several years back, and that whole series is on our website. You could spend time listening to that. But it's important to look at the King James Version because that is where the differences are as it pertains to our text. Now, you should know that the text that the King James Version is derived from started originally with a man by the name of Erasmus, E-R-A-S-M-U-S. And he published the first Greek New Testament in March of 1516. And this version he published was called the Novum Instrumentum. What does that sound like? Novum means new, and instrumentum means instrument. And so he published this version of, uh, that's called the New Instrument. And, and then beginning with the second edition, instead of calling it the New Instrument or the Novum Instrumentum, they started calling it the New Testament. And I guess that, that name stuck um, to this day. And this New Testament had a huge impact. Martin Luther said that the Reformation never would have started without Erasmus's New Testament in his hands. Now, later on, there are some brothers. Their last name was Elsevier, E-L-S-E-V-I-E-R. And they did a revision of this New Testament, and which would later be called the Textus Receptus. All right? And again, in the Bibliology series, I go into a lot more detail. This is just kind of skimming some of the, the thoughts here. And so they did a revision called the Textus Receptus, or the Received Text, um, which what becomes the basis for the King James Version. But Erasmus's translation, before it became the Texas Reception, Receptus, was revised many times. And, and, but in the first two editions of his New Testament, Erasmus left out that little additional part of 1 John 5, 7, because he did not see it appearing in any of the Greek manuscripts that were available to him during that time. And so he realized that, and he left that part out. And now, the fact that he left it out, that omission caused a lot of anger from many of his readers, much like it does today. Today, people are angry, and they believe that their translations are leaving certain things out, and this becomes a source of contention. And so he promised that if it could be found in any Greek manuscripts, he would add it back in in a later uh, translation. And so he, he, he based that on the Greek manuscript because it was found in a handful of Latin manuscripts, but he said, I want to see it in the Greek manuscript. All right? But so lo and behold, someone brought forward a Greek manuscript that contained these extra words that were there. And although Erasmus didn't think that it was true or correct, he held up to his promise, and he included this in the later edition of the New Testament. 
Now, as people look back and study the manuscripts that he used to include it, they believe that that manuscript was very late in, in time, that perhaps it was unreliable. And some people think that it was even forged to be able to get him to include it. And so since his work, remember I said his work led to the Elsevier's brothers, who, which eventually led to the Texas Receptus. And so since he included it in that work, um, it led to the origin of the Texas Receptus and that being included in the King James. But you won't find it in any of the modern translations, which are based on thousands and thousands of manuscripts that were later discovered. So that's the first issue with the Johannine comma, is that it was found, it's found only in the King James Version. Notice letter B. It only appears in a few manuscripts. Now, when Erasmus published the, his Greek New Testament, um, there were only six manuscripts that were available to him to be able to draw from. Only six. And none of them were earlier, dated earlier than the 10th century. Just to give you a sense, Christ lived around the first century, right? And so it gives you a sense of uh, 10th century, um, that, that many years earlier, later. And But today, he had six Greek manuscripts. Today, we have more than 5,600 complete manuscripts, plus thousands of fragments of single books with which to compare from. And some of those manuscripts date as early as the second century. All right. So 10th century with six manuscripts, some of them second century. And so as scholars have studied this passage to date, they have found only four manuscripts out of the 5,600 that have the reading that's called the Johannine comma. And those four manuscripts are all from the 1600s, all right? And so when the person asks a question about whether or not this was added in the 1600s, um, that's, that's how they were dating those manuscripts. And I just gave you the history of Erasmus. And so it would have been around the time, around the 1600s, when a Catholic scribe by the name of Roy discovered the manuscript that had this verse in it. He's the one that presented it to Erasmus. And it seems that the source of the wording that Roy presented in his manuscript was from traced back to a sermon on the passage that was written in the 8th century. Now they actually found the sermon about 200 years ago and the sermon in that sermon the preacher was commenting on the doctrine of the Trinity. All right, he was preaching from this passage. He was commenting on the doctrine of the Trinity. And that comment somehow became a part of someone's manuscript that came down to where we are today. Now, last time I had talked to you about the fact that today we all have a copy of the Bible. And if you don't have a copy and you come to church, there's one under the seat in front of you. You could access the Bible. But back then, not everybody had a copy of the Bible. And so they would borrow each other's copies and they would copy copies of their friends. And so you have to realize they didn't have the printing press. Um, and so everything was handwritten. Paper was very scarce. And so they would just write things from edge to edge. And so if somebody borrowed my copy of first John and they, the, the spirit moved them and they said, you know what? This sounds like the Trinity. And they start writing that in the, 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 par, the margin. It becomes, it's in their handwriting. So when somebody borrows their manuscript, they write the same thing down that the person wrote as a commentary. And so that's how some things get passed down. And so that is why this issue of the inclusion of this part of the verse is so hotly debated because it doesn't deal with something that's heretic. If it said something, if it was something that said, oh, the Trinity does not exist, everybody would say, take it out. But it deals with and it, the Trinity, which we're a Trinita Trinitarian church, right? And so that's what makes it so, so hot. And, and, and it deals with something that is, is true as it's written um, here. Now, it strongly defends it as it's written in the, in the King James Version, the doctrine of the Trinity. And it makes us wonder why. Anyone would even want to leave that out. 
However, and we'll talk about this a little bit more, the doctrine of the Trinity does not live or die on 1 John 5 and verse 7. It's not as if, if we didn't have this verse, we wouldn't know anything about the Trinity. We learn about the Trinity throughout the whole Bible, starting in Genesis. So this is not the only proof text that deals with the Trinity or defends the fact of the Trinity. And the fact that this issue doesn't come up when the church was battling some of the biggest heresies, um, for example, with Arius, shows that this was not an issue during those battles. Now, what do I mean? There was this man, Arius, that lived in the second century. And among the things that he denied was the doctrine of the Trinity. And so there were different times where the church had to battle people like that. And so there was a big battle with Arius about the fact that he denied the the deity of Christ uh, and the doctrine of the Trinity. And the church as a whole dubbed him as a heretic. They said, you're wrong. But if this verse was around during that time, the second century, it would have been a perfect verse for the church to show, to say, Arius, look, this speaks of the Trinity. And so again, this is not an issue of doctrine. And there's nothing here that I don't know from other verses. And so I told you all of that so that you would have the historical background. All right. And by no means... Um, what I said is a knock on the King James Version. The KJV is a great translation. That's the translation I grew up with. I've only been using the NASB for maybe 15 years. But even the translators of the King James Version knew that others in the future would be able to improve upon their translation. They didn't see their work as done. You could, again, you could come up and look at my copy. Again, this is an exact replica of how it was published in 1611 with the the font, everything. They they publish it exact as in 2011 when it was the 400th anniversary. That's an anniversary edition of it. But in the, in the, the, the original 1611 King James Version, they put a preface in there. And that same preface is in this one right here. And they have a section that's called the translators to the reader. All right. So they're, they're addressing, they're, they're speaking to the reader. All right. And they say that some rate readers may have misgivings about the alternative renderings suggested in the margin on the ground that they may appear to shake the authority of scripture in deciding points of controversy. And so they didn't think that they're, their translation was the final word on the word of God. They knew that later on there would be discoveries and there would be research that would help to clear up the meaning of the original. Now, the sad thing is, unfortunately, this preface is no longer published in the King James Version. And so people don't know that the original translators even wrote this. And so um, the, it, 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 it got lost throughout the years. And so the, the, the preface also explicitly denied that the authorized version or the King James was perfect. Listen to what else they say. They say perfection is never attainable by man, but the word of God may be recognized in the very meanest translation of the Bible. So they're saying the word of God may be recognized in the very meanest translation of the Bible. Just as the king's speech addressed to parliament remains the king's speech when translated into other languages than that in which it was spoken, even if it be not translated word for word, and even if some of the renderings are capable of improvement. Now, that's a huge statement. I think if this is a statement that if more people understood today, we wouldn't have all the version disputes that we have out there. They also say the whole history of Bible translation in any language is a history of repeated revision and correction. Now, I mentioned that the King James Bible that we hold in our hand today is was last translated around 1768. 
So nobody reads the 1611. There were revisions uh, throughout the years, and the one we have is 1768. Now, with this statement, they also seem to approve all later revisions of their work, because the very nature of Bible translation involves, as they said, a history of repeated revisions and corrections. And so they, by virtue of their words here, they did the best that they could with the manuscripts that they had available to them at that time. All right. And so since I mentioned manuscripts, let's talk about that for a little bit. Number two, the issue of manuscripts. All right. And this is a technical lesson, but it's going to be helpful for us as we we answer this. Now, when we talk about manuscripts, it is the type of manuscripts that tend to be the issue because it is from the manuscripts that the translations are done. So somebody takes a Greek manuscript and they translate it into English or they translate it into, into French or whatever. So notice letter A, the problem of differing manuscripts. Now, everyone who is an inerrantist agree that the original autographs written by the apostles and the prophets are the only ones under the divine promise of inspiration and inerrancy. We talked about this a few weeks ago. This means that the books of the Bible, as they were originally written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, were 100% inerrant, accurate, they were authoritative, and they were true. And so again, no inerrantist would question that. But the question comes up with the copies of the original manuscripts. And so we have to ask the question, are the copies from the originals free from error? But there's no biblical promise that the copies of the original manuscripts would be equally free or inerrant from copious errors. And so the Bible has been copied thousands and thousands of times over thousands of years. And so some copious errors are likely to have occurred. And so the problem is we don't have the original autographs. Wouldn't it be great if we had the original autographs and we could just go back and say, how did Paul write 1 Corinthians? And we see the original letter and we could compare it. We don't have those. Um, not even Shakespeare's works have originals. All we have are copies of copies. By the way, isn't it interesting how nobody uh, says, hey, did Shakespeare really write Hamlet? Or did he really say that? People trust that when it's come from just copies of copies. But everybody hammers against the Bible about its accuracy. But first thing, when we talk about manuscripts, it's important to remember that biblical manuscripts today, the ones that we have today, are 99% in agreement with each other. So if you take all the biblical manuscripts and you compare them, they're 99% in agreement with each, with each other. Yes, there are some minor differences like we see in our text today. Um, but the vast majority of the biblical texts are identical from one manuscript to the other. Now, to prove that point, there was a scholar, John Mill, in 1707. He published a remarkable piece of work, and it took him 30 years to complete this. And it was a Greek text with more than 30,000 variants in it. In other words, he took the Greek Bible, and he took all the manuscripts that were available at that time in 1707, and he compared all of them, and he showed that, what, what they, they all said. Now, while this might sound impressive, and it was impressive, it created an alarm for some Protestants. They said that his work was undermining faith in the scriptures. But a German scholar by the name of Johann Albrecht Bengel he examined the 30,000 variants, and he looked at it in great detail, and he got some more um, dozen manuscripts that he had collated, and what he found was most of the differences, again, 30,000 variants among all the manuscripts, he found that the differences are in punctuation, word ending, minor grammatical issues, repeating of a word, different spelling of a word, and other minor things. Those are the issues. He looked at all of that. And these are things that are just easily explainable. Somebody spells, listen, I spell 
when I grew up spelling neighbor, N-E-I-G-H-B-O-U-R, because I grew up somewhere where they use British English. In America, it's spelled N-E-I-G-H-B-O-R, right? It's the same thing. We're talking about the same thing, different spelling. So these are some of the things that was here. It was not a big deal. And so Bengal also produced the now famous statement, not one of these variants disturbs any article of the Christian faith. That's important for us to, to know. Not one of these variables disturbs any article of the Christian faith. And so what he was saying is when you look at all the differences that are out there, it doesn't affect a single doctrine in any way, whether major or minor. And so what God has done is, even though the original autographs have all been gone, the, 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 the copies are considered inspired. They're considered uh, to be accurate. And so look at the sentence on the screen. If you can read this, you have an extreme mind too. Can you read this? Only 55 people out of 100 can. I couldn't believe that I could actually understand what I was reading. The phenomenal power of the human mind, according to research at Cambridge University, it doesn't matter in what order the letters in a word are. The only important thing is that the first and the last letter be in the right place. The rest can be uh, a total mess, and you can still read it without a problem. This is because the human mind does not read every single letter by itself, but the word as a whole. Who could read this? So some people, you kind of struggle with a little bit. So you have a strange mind if you could read it, right? And I, just, I was reading it just, just like um, it was there. And so um, what's the point, right? Even reading that, our brains know what it's saying, right? Um, so the point is when you're reading these Greek manuscripts with the differences, the message doesn't change. The message comes through despite spelling errors or accent marks put in the wrong place or breathing marks or even word order. Now, a little bit more challenging of a situation, though, is on rare occasion, a scribe would intentionally change a manuscript to make what he thinks is an improvement in the grammar or he, he has some particular bent in theology, and so he, he intentionally changed a manuscript to, to straighten it out. Now, that would happen very rarely, but because the manuscripts were so similar, situations like that were easily spotted. They could see them. So then they did that through a process called textual criticism. All right? Now, and through that process, through textual criticism, we can be sure that we have... Uh, a Bible that's almost identical to what was originally written. So notice letter B, the process of textual criticism. Now, textual criticism is a science used in the translation process. It's not liberal people out there who are being critics of the Bible. Yes, we have those two. But this is a method used to determine what the original manuscripts of the Bible said. Therefore, through the process, we can have confidence that the Bible we have today is almost identical to what the apostles and prophets wrote 2,000 plus years ago um, as well. And so what textual criticism does is it compares manuscripts to each other, not to eliminate portions of it, but to determine what was the original. Now, some people have accused the textual critics of taking 100% of the Bible and reducing it down to 98% of the Bible. That's the accusation. They're like, see, you're, you're going through and you're taking things away, and so you're making our Bible less. But what's more accurate is that they have 102%, and through the process of textual criticism, they're bringing it back to 100%. Let's look at an example. How many of you um, write in your Bibles? I do it all the time. It's not wrong to write in your Bibles. You can write in your Bibles. You can make notes. And, and, and that, is, that is good. All right? Unless you have the, the not yet, unless you have the Schofield um, like Anthony has and he treasures that thing right now and, and he's not going to write in it. Right? It's used so someone else already wrote it. All right, somebody else already wrote in it. Just don't copy down their notes. All right? All right. 
So, well, you know, we write in our Bibles, but before the printing press, as I talked about, people would write in their Bibles and they would pass on their, their copies and, and people would, would make note of, of their notes. And so now keep in mind, they didn't have margins like we do today. They didn't have spaces between letters. And so you put your notes in the same line as what you were copying. And then again, somebody borrows your book and they copy your notes as well. Now you have a manuscript that has personal notes. And so the challenge many centuries later now is to discern by the textual critics that what was written was a scribal error or if it's what God said. And so textual criticism tries to determine what was the original. It's hard work. And that's why translations are such hard work when they're done well. For example, between Luke 6 and 4, verse 4, turn to, turn to Luke um, chapter 6. Let's look at that. Luke chapter 6. There's an example there of something that was a scribal note between verses 4 and verse 5. Everybody there? Let's start in, in Luke 6 and, and verse 3. I'll, I'll read it for us. <clears throat> and Jesus answering them said, Have you not even read what David did when he was hungry, he and those who were with him? how he entered the house of God and took and ate the consecrated bread, which is not lawful for any to eat except the priest alone, and gave it to his companions. On the same day he saw a man working on the Sabbath. He said to him, Man, if on the one hand you know what you are doing, you are blessed. But if on the other hand you do not know, you are cursed and a transgressor of the law. And he said, and he, he was saying to them, the son of man is the Lord of the Sabbath. Did you hear that between verses four and verse five? That was an insertion. You could see it there on the screen. Did any of you see that in your Bibles? It wasn't there. And the question is because the textual critics, they were certain that this insertion was not the word of God because this insertion was only found in one 6th century manuscript and none other. So let's say you have 500 manuscripts and in only one of the 500 you have this insertion, then you would think that this was a scribal error or just a commentary on that scribe's part and it wasn't part of the original. So how did they do this? Let us see the procedure of textual criticism. Now, a textual critic takes several things into account. For example, they take the age of the manuscript into account. The idea being that the older the manuscripts were, um, the, the, the closer they are to the original. Do you follow the argument? The thought is that the older ones are probably more accurate um, and, and closer to when the original was written. They also look, they look at the age of it. They also look at the character of the manuscript. Now, what do I mean by that? They look at how it was copied. For example, if you want to have a bed made um, in terms of the woodworking piece of it, right? And you're going and you're checking out carpenters or woodworkers and you go to one shop and they use rubber bands to hold their joints together and you go to the other shop and they use glue to hold their joints together, which one would you choose? Obviously, the rubber bands. Right? Makes your bed kind of water bed wavy. No? You'd, you'd want to go with the one with the glue. Why? Because it seems to be better. It's more sturdy. It's the same thing with manuscripts. Some manuscripts are copied carelessly, while others are copied carefully. And the thought is that one that's copied carelessly uh, may have mistakes. And so they, they give less credence to those. So they look at the age, they look at the character. Then they also make note of the number of manuscripts. For exa example, in the, the Luke 6 example that I gave you, only one manuscript had that insertion versus 500 others not having it. And so let's say today before I preach, I had stepped up here and I said to all of you, listen, I want you to write down everything that I say. 
I want you to take careful notes, and I want you to write it down. Um, where's Allie? Allie usually does that. Does a great job of doing that. Um, and she shows it to me afterwards. I'm like, wow, Allie, this is awesome. But, um, but you know, you all are smart people, and so you would do a good job writing down what I said. But some of you might miss a word here or there or misspell a few words. But if I lost my sermon and I came to all of you and I said, give me your notes, guess what I could do? I could rebuild my whole sermon just from your notes that you had written down. And so through the process of textual criticism, we can construct the Bible to 100% based on the manuscripts. And in those few instances where there's a difference, no major issue of Christian faith and practice is affected. And let's keep in mind that the, the, that the copyists and translators are also human beings and they make mistakes. And so the fact that the Bible is incredibly accurate is a testimony to the inspiration and preservation by God. Can we still trust the Bible? Absolutely we can. The Bible translations that we have today are God's word. The Bible today is just as authoritative as it was in the first century AD. We can completely trust the Bible as being God's message to us today. So saying all that, I don't have a problem with the Johannine comma being in the King James Version. And I don't have a problem with it not being there for all the reasons that I just mentioned. But at least now you know the reasons why it's there and how it got there. And while the Johannine comma does support the doctrine of the Trinity, it's important to know that we can learn about the Trinity all throughout the Bible. And so if you love the King James, you don't need to bash the other translations and, and talk about it and say things are left out. And if you love the newer translations, you don't need to bash the King James saying they added stuff that's not supposed to be there. And so this is not a major point of contention that we need to worry about. Amen? Good? <laughs> Cozy, we good? All right, let's pray. Lord God, thank you for giving us your word. And Lord, what we saw was a technical message that we, we had. And, and, but Lord, it's important to be technical at times and to look at how you have preserved your word. And, and yes, there are times where there are these little differences, but help us not to divide over that, but help us to understand why they came about. And with that understanding, we would be able to go out and we would be able to talk to others who might come up and, and, and criticize the word of God in some way. Lord, we know the word of God is true and it points people to our Savior. It presents the gospel. It presents the way for people to be saved. And in no way has that wavered over the years. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And so, Lord God, I pray for everyone here. I pray that each one of us could say and look within our hearts and we could say that we know Christ as our Savior. That we have put our faith and trust in Christ and we know that we would be with him in heaven when we die. And Lord, if there's anyone here who cannot say that, Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit would be speaking to their heart and even as we heard earlier, even in, as John was speaking about there's a problem in this world, a sin problem. 
and that Christ came to this world to deal with that sin problem. And the way he dealt with that sin problem is by dying on the cross and shedding his blood. His blood was shed for us. He died for everyone in this world. And Lord, so I would ask that question to everyone here. Have you dealt with your sin problem based on the blood of Christ? And if the answer is yes, then praise God. If you've put your faith and trust in Christ and you said, you are the only way that I could be saved, then praise God. If you're still trying to deal with it on your own, if you're still trying to earn your way into heaven or to earn salvation, then the Bible tells us that it's only through Jesus Christ. Whoever believes in him, God so loved the world, John 3, 16, whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It's a belief. It's putting our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. It's not faith plus works. It's not faith plus works and going to church. It's not faith plus works and going to church and giving money. It's who our faith in Christ alone. And so if you've not done that, you could do that this morning. You could call out to the Lord Jesus Christ. And you could say, Lord, I've never heard that before. I always thought that it was faith plus works plus going to church plus baptism plus giving money. But now I believe that it's just faith in Christ alone based on his shed blood. And I want to put my faith and trust in you now. Please forgive me, cleanse me, change me, make me who you want me to be. Listen, if you could pray that, the Lord God promises that he will save you. And he will change you. He will make you a new creation. Lord God, thank you. And I pray, Lord, for all of us here that we would take all of this to heart and we would listen to your word and we would respond to your word even now as we sing in Christ's name, amen.